it's my pleasure to introduce the moderator of the morning session and organizer, Todd Vanderop. Todd is a Regents Professor and Head of the Department of Pharmacology at the University of Arizona College of Medicine, Tucson, and he's our founding director of the Comprehensive Pain and Addiction Center. He's also a professor of neurology and anesthesiology and a member of Bio5 Institute. In addition, he's the author of over 100 or co-author of 135 original publications. So please uh, acknowledge Todd for his role in organizing this uh, morning for us. Thank you very much, Dr. Dake, for that nice introduction. And uh, I'm really honored to be here. So this is exciting to be able to talk a little bit about our work that we've been doing, uh, both at the University of Arizona as well as our partnership with OSU in the area of pain and addiction. And so with that, I'll start with the first slide and the fact that I'm excited to talk about this center. It's really a brand new center that we've put together over the last couple of years. And so I just wanted to give a little bit of history about this particular center. Uh, it came about in the fact that President Robbins, along with Dr. Dake, had a strategic plan for the University of Arizona in which they were going to look at initiatives in order to fund things that they thought would be uh, advantageous to the University of Arizona, but also be something in the fact of number of people who at the University of Arizona were working on. And so uh, the plan came about in 2017 and 18 in order to put forth this strategic plan. And uh, of course, uh, knowing the fact that we had many people that were working on chronic pain and opiate addiction, we decided to put in an initiative that I worked hard for through 2019. I've gathered up over 70 different faculty that were working in this area. And uh, we came together to put forth this initiative in which it was accepted by, again, Dr. Dakin, the president. Uh, and so we pushed forth in 2020 and became an actual center. So the University of Arizona uh, had its first comprehensive pain and addiction center. And with that, of course, I had to bring along some experts. And so we brought along Dr. Zebrahim and Dr. Pereka, uh, Dr. Ibrahim being our medical director and Dr. Pereka being our science director in which we took this center forward. And it wasn't until uh, 2022, so within the first two years, uh, uh, of course, uh, relationships grow, grow deep in this area. And so we had a great friend, Dr. Don Kyle, at Oklahoma State University, who reached out to Dr. Preck and said, hey, we'd love to partner. And so a partnership was created in 2022 in which we did our kickoff symposium and uh, presidents came together and you'll see a few pictures of those, uh, but really we came together based off our uh, desire to help people with chronic pain and opiate use disorder. And so I'm gonna share with you a little bit about the center that we put together. The center really has four different themes that come about. It includes a number of different people. Like I said, there's a, a number of people that are leaders. Uh, as well as Maria in Phoenix. So Maria is actually an OBGYN and an addiction specialist in Phoenix who sees patients and mothers with opiate use disorder. We have a large preclinical research team that's uh, investigating new molecular mechanisms for chronic pain, as well as how to reduce opiate use and to treat people with uh, opiate use disorder. We have a clinical research team, and this clinical team is uh, widespread, led by Dr. Ibrahim, in which we are looking at helping patients. So a number of these people are actually seeing patients. So Alyssa Gum at the VA, of course, sees patients uh, with opiate use disorder at the VA hospital. Susan Hadley continually seeing patients. But the team really wanted to think, how can we move research forward in clinical trials? And so this team has continually put forth uh, some research that I'll be showing you as far as clinical trials. We have a very large education and legislation because we knew that opiate addiction and chronic pain can't be handled just by doing research, but also by educating the community, educating clinicians, educating uh, healthcare providers, as well as students. And so uh, we have a very large team that has been educating our community in Arizona about opiate use disorder, uh, as well as developing a pair of professionals uh, that would be increasing our workforce. And hopefully I'll be able to share you, with you all the workforce that we've actually grown in the University of Arizona within a short period of time. And finally, also technology in which we've put together a, a small team, but the team continues to grow to how we can use technology to help, again, in pain and addiction. 
And so I'll start with the fact that we put together this partnership. And of course, uh, you will hear in the next talk from Dr. Kyle of what the uh, National Center for Wellness and Recovery brings into our partnership. So part of it, of course, is 25,000 novel compounds that, of course, Dr. Kyle brings along with his many years of experience in big pharma. 20 years of human data come in, as well as chemistry expertise and clinical addiction specialists. And again, you'll see some of that detail uh, by Dr. Kyle here in the next talk. That combines with our aid from NIDA, and so we want to always thank NIDA and the fact that they funded a P30 uh, Center of Excellence in Addiction Studies led by Dr. Pareka, in which this takes then our expertise at the U of A uh, in things like addiction and pain, but also assay developments in vitro and in vivo uh, screening, as well as advanced testing. So it combines that with the center that we put together, the Comprehensive Pain and Addiction Center, where we really want to take what we discover in the labs to the clinic. And you're going to see we've had some great success already, but uh, I think we're only at the beginning in which I think that uh, we'll continue to ramp up our clinical research and clinical trials in order to have something for patients with opiate use disorder. So this partnership has already created new federal grants. Uh, it's created things like intellectual property that's being developed. It's created things like new medications, and again, you'll see some evidence of that today. It's created educational programs and a growing workforce within the state of Arizona as well as Oklahoma State University, or Oklahoma State. It's created clinical trials and clinical research, building industry partners as we go. We are continually developing that workforce as well as producing joint publications that I will share with you all this morning. So the center, so it really, as I said, breaks down into four categories. And I want you just to be a little more familiar with the center that we've actually built at the University of Arizona in partnership with Oklahoma. We really want to become leaders in drug discovery. So we set the goal high in the fact that we want to become leaders and we want to have something that we discover that goes all the way through into clinical uh, trials within five, six, seven years if we can. So, and I'll show you some different ways, whether it's novel compounds or repurposing compounds. The preclinical group, first of all, is going to advance a long acting mu opiate antagonist for the fentanyl overdoses. We know that fentanyl overdose is a serious problem, and we've got uh, uh, two different approaches. One is developing novel compounds that, again, our partners Oklahoma State brings forth, in which we've already been testing that, and you'll see a little bit of data on that that Dr. Kyle will share with you, but we feel we can actually make advances in trying to prevent fentanyl overdoses. Also investigating new kappa opiate antagonists as medication-assisted therapies uh, for chronic pain, but also taking it uh, further than what is actually currently out there. Something like buprenorphine, of course, is out there, but it doesn't work well for things like chronic pain, and we believe that we can really advance that uh, set or series of molecules so that we can help people with chronic pain, but also help them with the negative effective components that Dr. Preck has been working on, as well as even helping with sleep and those who suffer from chronic pain and lack of sleep. We believe that also advancing non-psychotropic cannabinoids, I specifically say non-psychotropic and the fact that we do believe that there are other types of cannabinoids that may be helpful in helping uh, prevent cancer. And uh, to share with you uh, a clinical trial in which Dr. Ibrahim and I have actually taken metastatic cancer patients into in which they significantly reduce the use of opiates. Also investigating sex differences. So you'll, again, you'll hear a little bit about that from uh, the work of Dr. Pareka in which looking at the idea that we should not be treating males and females the same. There's big differences. And so you'll see some of that data looking at prolactin analogs and other things in which we believe that uh, we need to start differentiating uh, the groups between male and female and how we treat. Advancing other compounds like one point, uh, one, uh, angi angiotensin 1 through 7. This is a mass receptor agonist. It's been in the news a bit uh, in the fact that, of course, you'd think it affects cardiovascular, but the smaller peptide actually can inhibit inflammation. And so there's great interest. We've already taken this compound into clinical trials for people with inflammation after cardiovascular surgery and have shown a significant reduction in inflammation and actually cognitive improvement after surgery. The compound now has been uh, approved to go into a clinical trial for traumatic brain injury. And so this is a DOD supported grant that is just starting and we're enrolling patients now. And we hope to also take these compounds into chronic pain patients. 
investigating mechanisms for light therapy. So again, you'll hear from Dr. Mohab Ibrahim, in which he'll talk about non-pharmacological uh, methods to try to help individuals with chronic pain and inflammation, as well as investigating the endocannabinoid system. So colleagues at the University of Arizona have discovered that there's a significant decrease in the production of endocannabinoids. This is the cannabinoids that your own body makes, and it's, it seems to be prevalent in migraine. And uh, there's uh, data in the clinical trials in which they've actually showed that uh, people that suffer from migraine do have lower levels of endocannabinoids. And so looking at that in that particular case. We're also looking at exploring uh, biased agonism at opiate receptors, something that's been of interest in the opiate field for some time. And some of these novel compounds that come from Oklahoma State University have shown the fact that they can be very effective in inhibiting pain, but not producing that respiratory depression, and therefore reducing opiate overdoses. And finally, investigating how chronic pain leads to depression and anxiety, something of great interest that we have at the University of Arizona, helping people who we know suffer from depression and anxiety and looking at the uh, activities of a potassium channel that actually may work to help decrease that long-term depression that occurs in chronic pain. I want to point out the fact that this, these uh, preclinical research have been funded by a number of different agencies. Of course, the NIH is one of the biggest supporters in NIDA, uh, supporting it both through the center grant, a PPG grant that's now pending, as well as nine different R01s, three DOD grants. And I want to point out the fact that even though the center has really been up for a little over three years or so, uh, we've already put together 92 peer-reviewed publications uh, to really sort of uh, put out the idea that we are advancing the idea of uh, new therapies for chronic pain and opiate use disorder. All right, what about the clinical research? Again, is this stuff going to roll into patients? And we do believe so. So I want to share with you the idea that we are already advancing clinical trials for light therapy. And again, Dr. Ibrahim will share this with the group. Uh, not only looking at it for pain, but looking at it in just general CNS inflammatory disorders that may include PTSD and dementia. Advancing and repurposing medications, one of the fastest ways that we can actually make advances to help those with chronic pain and addiction is to repurpose compounds that haven't been tested. And so uh, Dr. Ibrahim and I actually pushed forward a compound uh, to repurpose in cancer pain patients that are currently actually enrolling now and looking at uh, decreasing metastatic cancer pain. Of course, metastatic cancer is the one in which very high doses of opiates are used, and our goal is to reduce that use of opiates. Clinical investigation of mental health and chronic pain. So we've already put out a, a couple publications that actually look at the uh, humans that suffer from chronic pain uh, and the correlation between anxiety and depression and trying to actually make a difference in how uh, these patients are being treated, not just for the chronic pain, but also for their depression. We're in the process of completing a, a cannabinoid trial. This is a dronabinol in which it's looking at metastatic cancer patients. Most of us know that most of the cannabis is still federally illegal. However, dronabinol is an FDA-approved drug. And we've taken it into metastatic cancer patients. And uh, the outcome is that uh, we've only had 14 patients enrolled so far, but all 14 patients reduced use of opiates, with I think uh, approximately half of them, seven of them, completely going off opiates and having much better treatment. We have ongoing clinical trials with uh, TDCS. So this is using this transdirect cranial stimulation, both for chronic pain and substance use disorder. These are ongoing clinical trials as well as evaluating other medications with other pharmas to see if we can repurpose those medications for use in chronic pain as well as medication-assisted treatments. We've uh, taken uh, the medication-assisted treatment support and training, so part of our clinical trials is also to go out and actually train physicians within different areas of Arizona, especially into rural areas where we can actually try to train people to better treat uh, patients with opiate use disorder. We're also advancing in neonatal abstinence. Uh, most uh, infants, when born, uh, unfortunately addicted to opiates. Their treatment is uh, somewhere from 28 to 30 days with opiates, as well as a few other medications at the University of Arizona, and a new program in which they're treating the mothers and the babies and don't allow the babies to actually leave the mother. They've gotten this down to six days. So from 28 to 30 days down to six days of treatment of which the babies can come off the opiates and are doing much, much better. But again, that's a combination treatment of the mother and the baby. So we're making big advances in our treatments for neonatal abstinence syndrome. And finally, part of that study is looking at oxytocin. 
And so there's a, a couple grants that are supporting the idea of looking at oxytocin and substance use disorder in neonatal abstinence, both in the patients and in the mothers. And so this is all funded by a number of different grants. And again, I just want to point out the idea that within our short period of time, we've been able to secure NIH funding, CDC funding, HRSA funding, DOD, the VA, foundation funding, all of it to sort of help support these clinical research in these clinical trials. We've also come up with 24 peer-reviewed publications, a new patent, and I want to point out the fact that we've started a new addiction fellowship for residents uh, in 2020 that has been gaining ground, and so we continue to expand that, uh, that fellowship. On the education component, uh, again, we know that tackling things like opioid use disorder and uh, chronic pain it takes more than just the research component. We really need to get uh, the community educated. And so I'm really proud of the fact that we've been able to start two paraprofessional programs. And so I'll pop both of them on here. But these are really exciting programs. And the fact that uh, we've been uh, luckily to get funding from HRSA in order to train individuals to actually go work with families. Now, these are actually specific grants that will help families that suffer from substance use disorder in order to help children that don't sort of carry on this trend of using substances. And so the first grant is one in which we train people to go out and to work with families that have substance use disorder in order to try to break the trend of using substances. Over 50 uh, trainees already within the last couple years that are already out working and uh, becoming trained to work, uh, to work with different families. We have also have a second paraprofessional program and it deals with peers. And so these are peers, these are people that have experienced uh, opiate use themselves or other types of substances and uh, so far we have graduated 28 of those to be in the community. So that then brings me to the workforce. So my big goal was not only to do research but also to get the workforce increased within the state of Arizona. And so, so far, we have significantly increased that workforce, especially into rural areas, in helping families as well as others, individuals that are suffering from substance use disorder. Our outreach has also included uh, medication-assisted training for clinicians by CME and telemedicine into rural areas. And again, we're uh, continuing to sort of spread how we can help people with opiate use disorder. We've created a minor degree program. I'm very proud of this. Within the last three years, we were able to put together a full minor. So you can get anywhere from 18 to 24 units uh, and get a minor degree in the substance use disorder. So we're trying to educate our college students on what it is to have substance use disorder and how to help people uh, as they continue throughout their college careers. We're also very proud of the fact that the NIH has supported a training grant, an R25 type training grant for Native American undergrads. This has been a very successful program led by Kathy Rogers there in the picture in which we're looking at uh, human neuro diseases. So we actually take these hands-on training approach with these students from the uh, Diné College in the Navajo tribe in which we are teaching them about uh, neuro, uh, neuro diseases, including pain and addiction. And I can say we already successfully have had four of those undergrads come into PhD programs that are now earning a PhD in uh, the areas of neuro, two of them actually working in the area of addiction and, uh, and pain. And so we're really proud of that program. And I know Kathy said that uh, this next year we have four more students that are applying three to PhD programs and one to an MD PhD program. We've also created education programs for uh, and using multiple uh, social media for platforms for adult responsible use of cannabis. This came through a, a grant from the Arizona Department of Health Services in trying to educate adults in the use of cannabis. We know that it's there. There's been a 45 percent increase in the use of cannabis. And so uh, we want to make sure that people understand that uh, cannabis is something that can be dangerous. There's many people that suffer from cannabis use disorder. Uh, and so that there may be proper ways to using this cannabis. And so uh, this has been a, a, an ongoing educational program now over the last year. It also has been reached, uh, they've been asking us to reach it out into high schools, even though they made us term it adult responsible use. They've said, could you actually also extend your program into high schools, and knowing the fact that many people in high school may be using cannabis. And so that educational program now is, is going into our high schools. And finally, we are also creating a program to reduce drug overdose. Now, this is, of course, the fact that there's lots of poly substances being used, stimulants, opiates, cannabis. And so together, we've partnered 
with two groups, the, our, our Arizona Poison and Control Center as well as the Center for Rural Health in order to get out into the communities within Arizona to help those with substance use disorder and trying to prevent drug overdose. Uh, a number of different grants also in our educational area, so it's always exciting to actually get grants in the education area. So we've got a CDC grant, a couple HRSA grants, NIH, as I said, for a training grant, the State Arizona grant, as well as starting to put out some publications on our education efforts. And finally, in our technology, again, a, an area that uh, we're just sort of putting together and growing. Uh, but as I mentioned, we've done some TDCS. See, these are this direct cranial stimulation in order to help people either with cravings. These are people that have given up opiates within the past year and are receiving TDCS to, in order to prevent or help reduce the amount of cravings that may occur uh, due to opiates or other substances. Uh, also using the TDCS and for chronic pain patients to see if we can reduce the amount of meds that are needed. We've been also looking at an app. So Maria in Phoenix has developed a very nice app for mothers in rural areas for opiate use disorder in order to get medical attention at any time, both during the pregnancy or after delivery, as well as uh, developing the potential for ultrasound in chronic pain patients. The new department head for neurosurgery is a person who has worked in chronic pain for many years and brings this technology as she comes to the university in order to say, can we use ultrasound to help individuals with chronic pain? And again, we've had some uh, ongoing grants here and hope to continue to expand our technology and uh, the use for opiate use disorders as, as well as for chronic pain. So in summary, I feel like in about three years, three and a half years since the design and the put together of this comprehensive pain and addiction center, we really have grown. We've grown twofold as far as membership. And so we continue to pull uh, people into the center. Uh, working in things like opiate use disorder is a is a great is an area in which we know that we can get many more people to come in to work because people are passionate. Everybody tends to know somebody that has suffered from opiate use disorder or some substance, uh, and in some cases, often having uh, death that is correlated uh, due to opiate overdoses or other types of substance overdoses. And so we continue to grow and bring in uh, great passion for many of our faculty and members to work in this field. We've partnered with OSU, and again, you'll hear more about this as the next speaker will come up and talk about what the National Center for Wellness and Recovery is doing. We've raised over $25 million in grants within this short period of time to, again, uh, push forward uh, the help that is needed for chronic pain and addiction. Published over 118 peer-reviewed papers, filed three new patents. We've certified 78 paraprofessionals. And again, we know that it's not just research. We need to get people out into our communities to help with opiate use disorder. And so 78 qualified. The workforce continues to grow. We've already employed 35 of those 78 paraprofessionals. But as they get in the field training, we'll have more and more of these uh, being employed in the different rural areas. And I'm proud to say that we've already put uh, people into seven different rural areas within the state of Arizona, seven different communities. Uh, counties within Arizona. We've created uh, 10 new educational programs, as I point out, a minor degree program, as well as we now have 23 Native Americans that are working again in our program or through our training grant in order to help, uh, again, in the areas of opiate use disorder and chronic pain. And finally, we continue to increase our clinical care, our clinical research, and our clinical trials. And so with that, I want to thank you all and what we're going to do is we are going to hold off on questions, but I'm hoping that you can sort of write down some different types of questions because at the end, we're going to have all the speakers come up and, uh, and hopefully uh, address different types of questions. Thank you. All right. And so uh, it is my great honor and pleasure to introduce my colleague and good friend, Dr. Don Kyle from Oklahoma State University. Dr. Kyle currently serves as the CEO uh, at the National Center uh, for Wellness and Recovery. He's also an adjunct professor in the departments of biomedical sciences at OSU, and with he has over 100 different issued patents, over 200 peer-reviewed publications, many, many years of experience with big pharma. He brings just tremendous biomedical insights to the field of addiction and medicine, as well as chronic pain. And so we're really honored to have Dr. Kyle here today. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Kyle. Uh, 
All right. Well, <clears throat> good morning, everybody. This is a super special opportunity for me to be here representing Oklahoma State University and the National Center for Wellness and Recovery. And uh, I have about 20 minutes, and I'd like to use about half of that time to introduce you to the National Center for Wellness and Recovery. And then in the second portion of the, my talk, I'd like to share with you some details, uh, not too many, but some details about some of the research projects that we have ongoing right now as Dr. Vanderwa Van uh, alluded to. Uh, this is really extra special for me because, uh, you know, sometimes as you go through your life, you meet people and they're just instantly your friends. And that's how I feel about the folks at the University of Arizona, especially Frank and Todd. So it's always fun when we have uh, reasons like this to get together, talk about science, share with other people what we're doing, and uh, it just really doesn't get any better than that. So I'm grateful to be here. Um, before I get into the presentation, I thought I'd share with you uh, some statistics which are alarming and, and terrifying, to, to, to be honest. Um, You'll see other statistics as we go through the day, I, I believe, and the other presentations, but I, I'd like to draw your attention to the table in the lower left corner of this, of this uh, slide, which turns the clock back about four or five years to the year 2019. That's the year that the Presidential Commission on the Opioid Crisis, which at the time was, was chaired by uh, Governor Christie from uh, New Jersey, published their findings on the causes of the opioid crisis and made a lot of recommendations about steps that could be taken in the future and things like that. And a lot of those steps were adopted and, and implemented uh, together with significant funding, policy changes, modified prescribing practices, all kinds of things. I'd like you to draw your attention to the, to the CDC statistics that I listed there under cause of death. Um, drug overdose caused by any drug substance in 2019 was around 68,000 lives in, in the United States. And you can see that that number over the last four or five years, despite all of the attention and funding and policy changes, it has not gotten better. It's actually, it's actually gotten significantly worse. Almost 60% increase in the number of overdose deaths in the United States um, in t uh, so far uh, in, in uh, projected for 2023, I should say. And as you heard earlier, that's largely driven by fent the impact of fentanyl um, into the system. But there are other substances like the stimulants and particularly methamphetamine, which is also rising. Uh, that the, the uh, cause of death related to methamphetamine back in 2019 was almost 15,000 people. In 2023, you can see that it's 133% higher than that, which is this needle is moving in the wrong direction. Those are not those are big numbers, and I, I'm always trying to think. And actually, I'm speaking with Dr. Pareka regularly. Like, how do you visualize that? You know, uh, and uh, in 2019, what that means is the number of Americans dying of a drug-related overdose was about 185 every 24 hours. Today, it's almost 300 Americans die every 24 hours from a drug-related overdose. I mean, that to me is just a startling statistic. And to really put that into perspective, I'll be standing here talking to you for about 20 minutes. There are four or five Americans that are going to die of a drug-related overdose while I'm standing here talking to you in this country. Unbel it's just unbelievable and terrifying. And it's getting worse. Uh, it's becoming much more dangerous. You heard Dr. Vanderwaal allude to, allude to the, the dangerous cocktails that are now very commonplace. Typically, fentanyl is uh, blended or cut into other substances of abuse like cocaine or cannabis, often without the end user of that material knowing that it's even in there. More recently, you hear about these other synth synthetic materials, the xylazine and the isotinidazine. These are synthetic materials that are mixed with the fentanyl to, to enhance its action and prolong its action, um, creating even more dangerous uh, cocktails. And of course, there are the prescription uh, drug counterfeits. Of particular concern is the Adderall, which is commonly shared on college campuses by students trying to stay awake and study. They can order this Adderall online from online pharmacies. 
and the DEA has evaluated uh, many of these sources and, f and find a significant number of them are contaminated with fentanyl, often a potentially lethal dose of fentanyl. And then the last point I want to make is that, you know, uh, we, we, most of us probably all have children, uh, or at least know people that do, and our I feel like our youth are in trouble uh, in these dangerous times. I was struck by CDC statistics uh, recently showing that the median monthly overdose deaths amongst our teenagers aged 10 to 19 has increased by 109% in the last four or five years. It's a staggering statistic and fentanyl in that age bracket is a major driver. And amongst those, uh, this age bracket, about 41% of the decedents had evidence of mental health conditions or are in, in treatment for mental health. So we really have to pay attention to our youth in, in, this, in the United States as well. So it's for those reasons we think about the National Center as having an urgent mission, like something has to be done urgently to, to turn this needle and turn these statistics back the other way. So our approach to this, and very similar to what you heard about from the University of Arizona, is um, you have to sort of tackle this from both ends of the problem. There are people right now who have problems with substance use disorders and they need treatment, they need care, they need counseling and medication. And so part of the National Center is designed to, to help address that. We have an addiction treatment clinic in downtown Tulsa. Uh, it's an outpatient clinic. And we have a network of telemedicine hubs across the state where, because it's a very rural, uh, rural state, these folks can get care through telemedicine as well. But in addition to that, we're currently enhancing our core competencies in neuroscience and drug design. And I'll give you some examples of this in a few minutes so that we can study the mechanistic basis for uh, the intersection of addiction, pain, and these mood disorders. And by understanding the basic neurochemistry of what's happening, maybe participate in the design of new generations of medications that will really help people suffering with these conditions and provide more options to their uh, doctors trying to help them. And through these two uh, uh, modes, we hope that the National Center can become an, uh, a national hub for research and clinical best practices, attracting and, and uh, nurturing meaningful partnerships with industry and academia and other government agencies as we, as we sort of grow up to, to deal with this problem. So that's our urgent mission. Now, like you heard earlier, we also recognize that these are big problems and we can't solve that by ourselves. And so partnerships are a crucial uh, element of our strategy. Um, we have uh, three, I call them three unique elements of the National Center because it's kind of, these are kind of unusual things for, a, for something that's set inside of a university. So for example, back in 2019, the decision was made in the state of Oklahoma that 100% of the settlement funds in the lawsuit between Purdue Pharma and the state of Oklahoma would be directed to the National Center. So the National Center received $177 million uh, at that point, which was very early in the, in the development of the National Center. And that's sort of a life-changing financial event for the National Center. Over the past few years and continuing on into next year, we're investing approximately $35 million into new laboratories, clinical space, new scientific instrumentation, and qualified scientists to join us at the National Center to build that core competency in neuroscience that I mentioned earlier. We've also taken a block of this money and set it into a long-term annuity that provides an estimated return of about $5 million a year to the National Center for, to help support our running costs. This gives us a longevity to support this program well into the future as we try to solve these difficult problems. And then about one year ago, the Oklahoma legislature through an ARPA award uh, granted OSU a $50 million grant to build a pharmaceutical R&D center in downtown Tulsa, which is going to be right in the middle of a new medical complex that's going to have a new psychiatric hospital, a new VA hospital, and the laboratories of the National Center all right there connected together in downtown Tulsa. So these are very unique uh, arrangements uh, that we have in Tulsa that I think over time will show 
that this uh, visionary type of funding is going to make a big difference. In addition to funding, we have some unique resources, beginning with some very generous contributions from citizens of Oklahoma who are very interested in helping the population of Oklahoma and the region. For example, the Zero family donated the building that we use for our addiction clinic, with a picture of it is shown here, in, also in downtown Tulsa. Not related to this uh, legal settlement with Purdue Pharma, but in a separate agreement, Purdue agreed to give Oklahoma State University access to over 20 years of their research. They gave us the physical samples of the molecules, the preclinical pharmacology, the clinical data, and to, to uh, enable us to, to leverage that information to advance the science and attract partnerships, which is exactly what we're doing. I think that's unprecedented for any pharmaceutical company to turn over all of their research to an institution like that. And then, of course, more recently, we have industry approaching us at the National Center who, for business reasons, are moving away from certain projects, and they, but they have assets that are important uh, in this field, and they're asking us if we could pick those up and use our, uh, our uh, wherewithal to move them forward into clinical trials. So, for example, we recently received a donation of a clinical stage non-opioid for pain, a, a so-called so sodium channel blocker, that we're now looking at how we can begin to move that through the pipeline. So those are examples of very interesting resources and unique to the National Center. And then finally, on the organizational side, we have, very similar to what you just heard from Todd, bench to bedside organizational structure. And this is just mission critical, because you have to have people on the front lines, the physicians, who are treating patients every day, talking to your basic research people. Because the physicians, through the interactions with their patients, they know firsthand what are the gaps in the treatment? Like, gee, I wish I had something that could do X, Y, and Z. Or the si this, this, this medication works really well, but the side effects, you know, it makes it so I can't, I can't use that for everybody. And you get these kinds of insights from the clinicians. Feeding that back to us in the research laboratories is a great mechanism to make sure that we focus our attention on those unmet medical needs identified on the front lines of the crisis. And that's our bench to bedside organization that I think is a, a, a real strength and very happy to see that I, I believe the University of Arizona has got the exact same uh, philosophy, which I think is powerful. And then finally, the National Center is, is different because uh, we, don't ha we don't have any full-time faculty tenured faculty researchers uh, in the National Center. We collaborate with our, with our faculty, of course, but we're, uh, we're bringing in uh, re PhD and non-PhD researchers into the National Center, almost like we're hiring them into a company. And their focus is to be focused on the mission and the critical objectives of the National Center teaching and, and and we do have students and and things like that but it's not it's not the main priority for these folks uh, their undivided attention is on the urgent mission of the national center i think that's also unique and taken together these three unique elements of the national center i think are uh uh r really set the stage for great things go as we go into the future I mentioned partnerships earlier. I'll just give you a few quick examples here. Uh, one of the partnerships that we've formed since 2022 was a partnership with the DEA delivering the, their one pill can kill mechanism. And this is related to the counterfeit uh, prescription tablets. And this was very popular in, in around Oklahoma and in the region. We were on social media. We've been on the nightly news broadcasts. We've been on billboards on the highway, even in sporting events on the OSU campus using the, the, uh, the uh, indoor billboards, uh, sending messages to the students to be careful about sharing prescription tablets, like you really shouldn't be doing that, it's dangerous. So this is a great partnership that the NCWR has had with the DEA, and, and that's ongoing. And then more recently, um, we're, work, we're working, we're leading an effort actually in collaboration with uh, industry, drug distributors, uh, and nonprofit organizations um, to provide a cost-free access to Suboxone tablets for folks who otherwise might not be able to afford that. And that's a work in progress, but we hope that we'll be able to announce something there maybe later in this year. 
But of course, our favorite partnership is the one we have with the University of Arizona. They're our best friends, and as, as you heard earlier, uh, in April of last year, we had a wonderful kickoff celebration at this incredible innovation center on the campus at Tucson. Uh, I, honestly, I think it's the most beautiful building I've ever seen. Uh, it was just super impressive. Our partnership has enjoyed support at the highest levels of both universities. We had the presidents of both universities present at the conference and they both made introductory remarks and continue to be just fully supportive of our partnership uh, all, all the way th uh, through now and into the future. Um, uh, Dr. Pereka is, uh, sent an invitation to Dr. Nora Volkow, who's the head of NIDA, as we all know, inviting her to come as well. She was not unable to make it, but she did send us a video message, which was very thoughtful. And I just took a quote from that because I think that sums it up. This partnership uniquely combines the sciences of pharmacology and molecular design to uncover the uh, underlying mechanisms of pain and addiction, and that's one of our main focuses. A couple of quick ideas uh, about some of our research projects. I'll go through these quickly. Uh, vaping, as we all know, is super popular. Recent studies show about two and a half million uh, U.S. middle school and high school students uh, vape regularly. For high school, that, that reflects about 14% of the high school population is vaping on a regular basis. Um, it's not a surprise if you consider how these devices are marketed as toys or even camouflaged as school supplies like Sharpie pens and things like that so they can be easily hidden in their schools without your parents or the teachers knowing that they're there. Um, but we're interested in studying the effect of vaporized substances uh, at the neuronal level. There's some pictures down there at the bottom of mini scopes that we can use to look directly at the brains in animal models to identify the damage at the molecular level caused by drug vaping. Hopefully we can identify new drug targets through this process and then get into drug design and begin to figure out uh, methods for treatment of this. You heard earlier about uh, the, 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 our, our work to try to reverse fentanyl overdoses. Fentanyl is a particularly difficult problem. Um, I c made it here as a little green star. The way fentanyl works is it binds to a receptor in the brain called the mu opioid receptor. Let's just call it the MOR. And when it binds there, it activates that receptor and it produces an analgesic effect, but it also produces euphoria, respiratory depression, and ultimately overdose risks and even addiction risks. Focusing here for a minute on the overdose risks, we're all aware of Narcan. The active substance there is naloxone. When administered, Narcan can go into the brain and compete for binding with fentanyl and actually push it off of that receptor and therefore shut off its actions and reverse the overdose. The problem is that fentanyl sticks to the MOR with a lot more tenacity than Narcan does and it's difficult to get it to come off, often requiring high concentrations of, uh, of Narcan to do that or multiple doses. Our goal in this program is to desi design molecules that can outcompete fentanyl with a single dose with a long-lasting reversal of the overdose effects. And some data on the right, if you just look at the lower right-hand corner, I'm going to use my, my pointer here to show you this. Um, well, maybe not. If you, look at the, if you look at the gray bar, this is what, if you look at the yellow horizontal line around 100, that's the breathing rate, normal breathing rate for a, for a mouse. And you can see that if the mouse is treated with a 0.3 milligram per kilogram dose of fentanyl, the breathing rate drops down almost, almost you know, a little more than, uh, almost uh, tw 25 percent, let's just say. That's the respiratory depression effect. But notice in the, in the uh, pink colored bar, orange pink colored bar, if we take one of our molecules at the exact same concentration, 0.3 milligrams per kilogram, and dose it with the fentanyl at the, at the same dose, the respiratory depression doesn't occur, and the breathing rate is maintained in the normal range. In other words, we're blocking that effect. Naloxone can do the same thing in this study, but notice that's, that's dosed at two milligrams per kilogram. That's almost a seven times higher concentration of naloxone to get the same reversal of the fentanyl effect. So this experimental drug that we've designed, and this data comes from the University of Arizona, is showing us that we already have some interesting molecules that can 
uh, bind with high affinity to the receptor and reverse uh, or block fentanyl uh, respiratory depression. So hopefully we can change the picture like I showed there in the table and create a new generation of ultra high potent fentanyl reversal agents which are, are desperately needed now. And then finally, uh, just very briefly here, uh, another project that we hear a little bit more about later when Dr. Pereka speaks. We're looking at medication assist, new medication-assisted treatments at the interface of pain, addiction, and sleep. And I just talked about the MOR receptor, you know, that alleviates pain. But with prolonged exposure to, to opioids, another receptor, let's call it the KOR, that's the kappa opioid receptor, becomes more prominent in the brain. And it starts to promote pain and starts to disrupt sleep. It's taking things in the opposite direction. So when I first started speaking with uh, Frank about his research in this area, he said, hey, could we make a molecule that can kind of activate the MOR, but not fully, and also bind to the KOR and shut it off completely? That's a challenge, finding one molecule that can bind to two different proteins and then do two different functional things to them is not so easy. But we've, we've done that, and uh, the data over on the right shows if you look at the affinity measure for KOR, 0.3, the lower the number, the tighter the binding. And you can see that it's 0.3 for both the KOR and the MOR, meaning that this molecule binds to both targets with very high affinity. If you look at the efficacy, though, on the KOR, that means how strongly does it activate the receptor. At KOR, it's zero. It doesn't activate the receptor at all. It's a blocker, exactly what Frank was looking for. And if we look at the MOR, it's a weak activator. Instead of 100% activation, we're only getting about 25% activation. And we hope there'd be some advantages with that. And this work, uh, this molecule will, is the subject matter of a joint NIDA grant that we just recently submitted. Um, and joint publications and patent applications are planned for the near future. And we hope that this research and these molecules ultimately lead us to a new, pr a new approach to medication-assisted treatments. So in summary, I, I just want to conclude by saying that despite the significant efforts around the nation, the funding, and so forth, our drug crisis has really worsened in the last five years. Our partnership began with some research ideas, our partnership with the University of Arizona, talking about research ideas, but it's really expanding into much, much more than that. We have very synergistic scientific expertise. We share a common mind about the research process and the strategy to tackle these problems. We both are, are designing our research projects to, be, to translate into meaningful solutions to the drug crisis. We're running clinical trials, we're sharing technology, and the greatest thing about science, we're teaching and learning from each other, and we're creating friendships that will last a long time between both universities. I think our partnership is unique for all of those reasons, and it's my pleasure to be here to tell you a little bit about that this morning. Okay, thank you, Don. That is just exciting, and I know we just saw a little bit about the science there, but I am just ex extremely excited about these novel compounds. So I really do believe that we're going to make a big difference, and uh, the quicker we can get those into clinical trials, the, uh, the more excited uh, I'll be. Okay, so uh, we're going to move on now, and uh, we're going to turn to one of my great colleagues, uh, a mentor of mine, a great friend, a person that I've worked with for, I don't know if I should say, over 30-something years. <laughs> uh, but uh, it is my great pleasure to introduce Dr. Parekha. He's a professor of pharmacology and anesthesiology and a member of the University of Arizona Cancer Center. And as I said, he's the director of our science for the Comprehensive Pain and Addiction Center. Uh, his laboratory studies all kinds of mechanisms of chronic pain. Uh, I'm pretty sure that Dr. Parekha, Dr. Parekha has earned and achieved just about every single award that you can get for pain research throughout uh, the United States as well as international. As a matter of fact, he's even earned the, uh, the Melzac, uh, the Ronald Melzac Award for the International Association of the Study of Pain. Uh, he's been funded by the NIH for well over 30-something plus years. He's looked at me more, 40, 
40 plus years <laughs> continually. Uh, he's published well over 600 peer-reviewed publications. Uh, he really is one of the, the people that we all look to for mentorship and understanding chronic pain. So uh, please join me in welcoming Dr. Frank Preka. All right, well, good morning. Uh, thank you very much, Todd, for that introduction. And um, uh, I just want to begin by uh, uh, thanking uh, Dr. Dake and Dr. Vandera for organizing this uh, meeting and inviting me to be a part of it. And um, just a special uh, um, a message to Dr. Kyle and the uh, representatives from Oklahoma State University. I think Dr. Kyle put it beautifully. It's our favorite partnership. And uh, we've already accomplished a lot. We have much, much more to do. And I think we're, as, uh, as Dr. Kyle put it, we're of the same mind and we have the same goals. So I'm very excited about all of the things we're doing there. And lastly, I just want to take a moment to um, thank Dr. Uh, Valentino for coming. Thank you so much, Rita, for taking the time to be with us. And uh, um, many, many thanks to the National Institute on Drug Abuse for the support that we've had for just uh, you know, uh, many, many years that have been th the basis of everything that we've been doing. So um, you've heard from uh, Dr. Vandera and Dr. Kyle about the opioid crisis. That's been a major focus of uh, the efforts uh, that we have at ongoing at the University of Arizona and at Oklahoma State University. What I'd like to do to, uh, in this uh, presentation is to talk about something that's related to the opioid crisis, but that is also different. And I'm talking about that as the pain crisis and what I'd like to uh, explain to you is that pain has a tremendous impact, a negative impact on our society, and that we don't have any uh, medicines, really, that can help to treat patients with chronic pain. Uh, and related to this, most of the world's pain patients, chronic pain patients, are women. And we don't really have medicines that can help to treat women with chronic pain. And so um, let me just begin by giving you a sense of the scope of chronic pain in the United States. And the best, the best uh, data really come from the Institutes of Medicine of the, uh, of the uh, National Academies of Sciences. And they uh, issued a, uh, a report called Pain in America. And in that report, they stated that about 116 million people in the United States can be classified as uh, experiencing chronic pain. So that's about 30% of all Americans. And uh, you know, perspective is everything. So if you think about those numbers, that is more uh, uh, that, is, that is more people that live with chronic pain than individuals that suffer from cancer or heart disease or diabetes combined. So it's a huge, huge and tremendous uh, number. Uh, and so we define chronic pain as pain that persists for more than three months. And again, it affects about one in three people in, in the United States. But a subset of these individuals we define as experiencing high impact chronic pain. So these are individuals that uh, can't really participate in activities of daily life. They can't interact with their families. They can't uh, go to school. They can't go to work. They can't achieve in their lives. And, um, and, and so chronic pain, you know, devastates their, their existence. So the point I'm making here is that these numbers are numbers that exist today in spite of all available medications. And so we don't have medicines that can help to treat these, these patients. Now, the other thing about chronic pain is that it produces a variety of comorbidities. Uh, and so I've just noted a couple of them here. 77% of uh, individuals with chronic pain uh, suffer from depression. And 86% uh, suffer from sleep disruption. And this has already come up in the presentations. And I'm m noting it again here. I'm going to come back to that in just a couple of moments because there seems to be a very strong bidirectional relationship between pain and sleep and also opioid use disorder. And we think that uh, one of the uh, strategies that has not really been implemented is to attack both chronic pain and opioid use disorder by uh, evaluating and normalizing sleep. Uh, and so the, 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 the other point about uh, patients with chronic pain is, again, they don't have good medicines to treat their pain. And so they tend to self-medicate. The most common medicines that are used for the treatment of chronic pain are alcohol and tranquilizers. Um, I didn't, uh, uh, I'd forgotten to put cannabinoids on, on the slide, but, and also opioids. And the, these are all drugs that depress the central nervous system. And chronic pain patients are often uh, sick patients. They have uh, many, many medical problems. They have uh, kidney problems, which uh, prevent the clearance of these drugs from their body. They have sleep apnea and they often take these medicines in combination. 
and when they take them in combination, it produces respiratory depression and contributes to, over, uh, to overdose deaths. So these are the impacts of uh, chronic pain on individuals, and of course, we can't ignore the impact of chronic pain on society, and again, the data come from the Institutes of Medicine, where they estimate that uh, chronic pain uh, impacts society uh, in tremendously in financial terms with about $635 billion in medical costs um, each year. Now, there is a relationship between opioids that are used medically for the treatment of pain and the opioid addiction crisis. And in fact, the opioid addiction crisis began with overprescription of medicines, opioids, for the treatment of chronic pain. Now, that has changed. It has changed now. It's being driven, as uh, has already been mentioned, by synthetic opioids such as fentanyl. Uh, and uh, the consequence of this has been to move away from opioids for the treatment of pain, for the treatment of pain in general. And um, uh, what I would like to emphasize is that opioids, though, remain very, very important medicines for the treatment of some types of pain. So opioids remain an essential part of the physician's uh, uh, armamentarium for the treatment of um, uh, pain that's related to trauma for the treatment of post-operative pain, post-surgical pain, and also for the treatment of cancer pain. And so we need opioids in, uh, in those uh, appropriate medical uh, uses. Now, the problem with the use of opioids for the treatment of pain is that for each additional day that a patient is exposed to an opioid, the risk of addiction increases. And for chronic pain, we need to treat pain over a long period of time. And that's where opioids become inappropriate. And so what we've learned from many, many years of research is that the use of opioids for the treatment of chronic pain ends up doing more harm than it does good. And so um, this uh, really, again, reflects the, the tremendous unmet medical need uh, of not having good medicines that are available to help patients that are suffering from chronic pain. Now, I wanted to explain why, or try to explain why, it's been so difficult to discover new medicines for the treatment of, uh, of pain and, and the treatment of chronic pain. And to do that, um, we have to take a moment to actually uh, think about pain and understand pain. And so what I've put down on this slide is to uh, ask the question of why treating pain is so difficult. And what I'm trying to point out is that in almost every uh, area of medicine, we can get quantitative readouts of uh, the state of the patient and the state of the disease. So if a patient has hypertension, there's a device that we can use to measure blood pressure. If there's cardiovascular dysfunction, there are devices that can assess the, the, you know, the efficiency of the heart. We can image the brain. We can use uh, in metabolic disorders, we can do blood tests and urine tests. But for pain, pain it's different. For pain, there's not an instrument. There's not an analytical test that we can use to assess the degree of pain. And that's because pain, by definition, is subjective and it's personal. And what pain means to one person is different from what pain, that same pain or that same disease condition may mean to somebody else. And so right now, the only way that we can assess and, and measure pain is through self-report. So to assess pain, we just ask patients about their pain. And we use a variety of different scales, a numerical rating scale that you see here on the top. Um, with zero to 10, and we ask the patient, what is their degree of pain? They give us a number. Uh, for children, we use a sort of a smiley face scale that, that uh, gets at the same uh, thing. And so the patient will give us a number. It's a subjective self-report of their own assessment of the pain uh, based on um, the, their, um, uh, their degree of, uh, of pain, their, their, their mood, their, their, uh, their life circumstances. All of those things will affect their subjective interpretation of pain. And that, of course, is different from the quantitative numbers that physicians um, are used to seeing and that physicians really would like. A and that uh, results in, in distrust and, uh, a and a little bit of a, uh, difficulty often in actually believing the patient. And so right now, what, uh, what I think has been uh, a problem is that sometimes patients do not have their pain actually uh, assessed properly and, and treated properly because of suspicion on the part of physicians that may, in fact, be uh, justified. So we, in, in, in other areas of sensory function, if we ask a patient to read an eye chart, they tell us they can't read the, the bottom line, we believe them. But with pain, sometimes that doesn't happen. And it sometimes doesn't happen, especially in some groups, uh, such as women and in minorities, where pain is dismissed uh, as uh, being related to hysteria or perhaps for 
for other motivations such as insurance fraud or um, opioid seeking. Now, a couple more words about pain. Um, we can think about pain as being something that's negative. It's something that uh, we don't like. But in fact, pain is actually something that's really essential for our survival. Pain is an alarm sensor. Pain is telling us that there is something that's happening that can actually damage our bodies. And so we need to know about pain. We need to be able to detect pain because uh, pain is warning us that there is something that's happening that is going to be um, uh, deleterious. Because pain is so important, it demands our attention. And it demands a, a behavioral response. And so when we have pain, we have to take action. So pain is essential in protecting us. The other reason that pain is so important is that it promotes learning. So we learn that if we experience pain in a particular situation, we need to never do that again. So um, I, I like to say that once we touch a hot stove as a toddler, we will never intentionally touch a hot stove again for the rest of our lives. It produces such a powerful memory that helps it to protect us. So pain is essential. And there are very few uh, people in the world, maybe 20 or so, that um, have an inability to detect pain. Those are individuals that often die very young because they don't know that um, they, they, their bodies can be damaged. So um, we detect the types of stimuli that can produce tissue damage by a, sp a specific class of sensory nerves called nociceptors. Uh, and the nociceptors uh, basically transmit a signal from uh, a part of the body to the spinal cord and then up to the brain. And so this is uh, the, the classic pain pathway uh, that uh, we can think of as physiological pain, good pain. We need it to survive. Now the problem that we have is that in some cases this signal doesn't stop. It continues going. And then it becomes chronic, and that means that we can't turn the alarm off. And that is when uh, we have chronic pain. And I'm illustrating this to you because, again, the difficulty in discovering new medicines for the treatment of pain is that we need to stop this continuous signal, this alarm, the pathological pain, but we still need to keep the physiological pain. And we still need to have pain patients know if the bath water is too hot or if the coffee is too hot. And so we need to separate treatment of pathological pain by keeping physiological pain. So um, one more thing about pain that, that gives you an illustration of the difficulty that has to do with uh, creating treatments. Um, I'm showing you here an injury to the knee. Um, and we say, my knee hurts. But that's, of course, not where pain is. Pain is never in the knee. Pain is always, always in the brain. And so what we're studying in the knee is the nociception. Uh, that's the part that is easy for us to deal with. Uh, but the pain is always in the brain. And the brain has the subjective interpretation of what that nociceptive signal is. So pain and nociception are completely different. And what I'm trying to illustrate here is the idea that the sensory input is converted by the brain into a meaningful experience. And um, I'm going to uh, illustrate this by showing you that this is not specific for pain. And I'm going to let you read this slide here. Um, Mohab uh, thought perhaps I forgot to use my spell checker here. But, <laughs> but this, I think, illustrates the difference between pain and nociception. The point is that nociception is sort of like a charcoal sketch. But pain is uh, a painting with colors and that can create emotion. And that's the last point I wanted to make about pain, that pain always comes with an emotional valence. So other sensory experiences are affectively neutral, uh, but pain is always unpleasant. Pain is aversive. Pain is unpleasant at threshold. And it is that aversiveness, that unpleasantness of pain, that provides the teaching signal that allows us to learn. And so it's the unpleasantness of pain that actually protect us. And so what we'd like to do is we'd like to treat the unpleasantness of pain. In other words, we'd like to separate the mind from the body. And of course, that's what opioids are so good at doing. And that's what we're trying to recreate, but in a different, in a different way. Now, the last point is that, again, uh, most pain patients in the world are women. And we've, not, we've, uh, we've known this, but we haven't understood it. And we haven't really studied it. And we're now study starting to understand it. Um, and uh, I'm noting here a proclamation that was made as far back as 1986 by the International Association for the Study of Pain when they declared the Global Year Against Pain in Women. And in that proclamation, they stated that women are overrepresented amongst patients with chronic pain, and that remains true. 
um, that many pain conditions are more prevalent in women than in men. Uh, and I'm showing you here on the chart some of those pain conditions. And so you can see conditions such as uh, fibromyalgia, uh, almost exclusively a female disorder, uh, irritable bowel syndrome, uh, migraine, temporomandibular disorder, almost all, uh, uh, um, not almost, all of them largely uh, female dis uh, prevalent, three to one female uh, to male. And lastly, there are pain conditions, many pain conditions that only occur in women. So the pain that's associated with endometriosis, for example, um, vulvodynia, uh, the pain that's associated with the menstrual cycle, dysmenorrhea. So in 1986, uh, the International Association for the Study of Pain declared um, that women's pain has a significant global impact, and that remains true. And they stated at that time that a lack of awareness and recognition persists, and I think that that is now changing. And uh, at the University of Arizona, we have a, a major effort in trying to understand the reasons for uh, women's pain and the, the underlying mechanisms that can promote pain in women. So what are we actually doing at the University of Arizona and at Oklahoma State University to combat opiate addiction and chronic pain? Well, uh, you've already heard about this innovative partnership that we are uh, so excited about and so happy about. Um, this is a partnership that, again, brings together expertise in uh, uh, the, uh, in chemistry from Dr. Kyle and in the neurobiology of pain and addiction uh, that we have at the University of Arizona. Uh, these interests and this expertise is really complementary with the interests of the National Institutes of Health and especially with the National Institute on Drug Abuse and with the HEAL initiative. Uh, we're supported by different centers. You've heard about the Com Comprehensive Pain and Addiction Center, um, the NIDA-funded uh, Center of Excellence in Addiction Studies, and the National Center of Wellness and Recovery. And the goal is to uh, promote mechanistic understanding um, of the overlap between pain and addiction. And it is really that overlapping neurobiology that gives us the uh, opportunity, that gives us the opening to uh, attack both chronic pain and addiction. And I want to show you this uh, concept by showing you some of the overlapping neurobiology of pain and addiction. And what I'm showing you here uh, is um, uh, of the neurobiology of, uh, uh, of chronic pain and addiction. What I'm showing you here is this uh, addiction cycle. Uh, you've already heard a little bit about this. We know that addiction is, uh, to opioids begins sometimes with the activation of the mu opioid receptor that creates positive reward and euphoria. And so that creates what is known as the binge intoxication phase that uh, promotes drug taking uh, through a process of positive reinforcement. Now, over time, though, there are adaptations that occur in the brain where this reward process is diminished, so there's tolerance that occurs, and there's an upregulation of anti-reward mechanisms, including especially upregulation of uh, an endogenous opioid known as dynorphin that acts at this kappa opioid receptor that Dr. Kyle uh, talked about. And the kappa opioid receptor is important because it seems to promote the aversive qualities of pain and the aversive qualities of impending opioid withdrawal. And so when blood levels of opioids drop, uh, patients start to feel sick and they start to, um, to want to overcome that sickness. It's uh, a, a state that's uh, been referred to as being dope sick. And that, again, fuels drug taking through now through a process of negative reinforcement. And lastly, this process continues because uh, now there's preoccupation with continued seeking for drugs. So all of this is driven by exogenous opioids, and uh, we know the brain circuits that are important for these different phases. Uh, we can study those in preclinical models, and what we've understood is that the effects of these exogenous opioids in promoting this addiction cycle and the brain circuits are exactly the same ones that are affected by uh, endogenous opioids that mediate uh, the, consequences, the consequences of chronic pain. So in our partnership, what we're doing is we're using that information, that uh, overlying neurobiology, to uh, create programs to treat opiate addiction and prevent relapse, uh, to treat chronic pain without or with minimal risks of addiction, and lar uh, again, to focus on uh, treating pain in women. So the programs that we have ongoing, you've heard about some of these already. Uh, we're trying to create uh, 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 opiate antagonists. Dr. Kyle already talked about this. We have anti-fentanyl monoclonal antibodies that we uh, are working on, and we're uh, working on the discovery of medication-assisted treatments, again, using this uh, neurobiology, overlapping neurobiology for um, uh, between uh, uh, um, addiction and chronic pain. And the last uh, couple of points I'm gonna make is there's this remarkable overlap between sleep and pain 
and sleep and opioid use disorder. And what we've recognized is that chronic pain can disrupt sleep, but sleep disruption actually uh, sustains and maintains chronic pain and may lead to poor decision making in, in, uh, in uh, addicted uh, patients. The kappa opioid receptor becomes important in this because it promotes sleep disruption in the absence of pain, in the absence of opioids. And so if we can block the signaling of dynorphin at the kappa opioid receptor, that this may be an entry point into the treatment of chronic pain by improving sleep and an entry point perhaps into combating addiction by uh, improving sleep. So we're working on kappa opioid receptor antagonists. Dr. Kyle's already mentioned these. Um, I want to point out that the, uh, the negative affective qualities of chronic pain may be mediated through the kappa opioid receptors, and that may also be highly related to uh, the comorbidities of uh, pain, uh, including generalized anxiety disorder and uh, anhedonia and depression. And so if these drugs are effective, they really will revolutionize psychiatry. And lastly, we're using uh, these bifunctional molecules to counteract the adaptations that occur in the brain decreases in reward and uh, upregulation of anti-reward mechanisms. Now, the very last thing I'm going to tell you about is this idea of uh, new therapies of pain in women. We've talked about uh, female-specific pain disorders, female-prevalent pain disorders. There are no medications that are designed specifically for the treatment of pain in women. And assessment of uh, the patient as male or female should be the most fundamental uh, part of the, the decision that a physician should make in uh, the choice of a therapy. And so what we've learned from looking at and studying human dorsal ganglion cells, these nociceptors taken from, uh, from post-mortem samples from men or women, is that in fact these are different. So the nociceptors, the fundamental building blocks of pain, are actually different between men and women. It's a concept that has not been presented in medical school. We haven't ever taught this. It's a new idea. It's a new revelation. But what it means is that the mechanisms that promote pain in men and women are different, and that gives us the opportunity to design therapies that are specifically targeting pain in men or pain in women. And in women, what we found is that uh, these female nociceptors are engaged by a circulating neurohormone called prolactin uh, that circulates at higher levels in women than in men. It's under control of estrogen. Prolactin is uh, designed uh, physiologically for milk production, it's, uh, its major role, but it does many other things, including uh, the uh, engagement of these female but not male nociceptors. And so uh, that has led us to create uh, a, uh, a, s a series of molecules, anti-neutralizing uh, uh, molecules for prolactin, humanized prolactin monoclonal antibodies that we think may be very useful for the treatment of female prevalent pain disorders. And, uh, and with that, I'm going to stop and thank you for your attention, and uh, I hope I didn't go too much over time. <laughs> Okay. <clears throat> Great. Thank you, Dr. Pereka. So uh, you can all see why he's a leader in the area of pain research and puts a fantastic mentor. Okay, we're going to go ahead and move on to our next presenter, which is going to share a little bit of light onto our pain treatment. So Dr. Mohab Ibrahim is a board certified anesthesiologist and a pain management specialist and considered really leading, a uh, leading expert in our field. After completing a general surgery internship at the U of A, he then went on and joined the Brigham Women's Hospital at Harvard Medical College in Boston for his residency, and then after was a clinical pain fellow at Mass General there at Harvard Medical College. So today he's going to talk to us a bit about the role of phototherapy in treating pain. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Ibrahim. Thank you very much, Dr. Vandra. Uh, it's really an honor and a privilege to be here. I want to thank Dr. Dake for inviting me, Dr. Vandra for also inviting me here, and Dr. Pareka and Dr. Kyle for entertaining, ha having me around. So thank you very much, everyone. <laughs> so uh, before I start, please allow me to share this disclosure with you that the green light therapy is patented under the University of Arizona, and uh, we have outside interest in Luxon Therapeutics. And any conflict of interest resulting from this are uh, being managed by the University of Arizona. So, September was only a couple weeks ago, and September is the pain awareness month. However, if you ask most chronic pain patients, they will tell you that every month, every day, 
every hour they are aware of their pain. They don't need a reminder on the calendar. And that can be for many reasons. Um, despite having great tools, we still having patient facing challenges because of their chronic pain. I'm also an anesthesiologist. And in the past, anesthesia was very simple to administer. Didn't take much. Unfortunately, the mortality rate was high. And also, there was a prevalence of headache with this approach. But anesthesia went through several evolution rounds. And now, it became a very complicated process. And, but that resulted in a significantly decreased mortality rate. And I would say the same thing happened with, uh, with pain. Pain medicine went through a lot of evolutions, and now we have a lot of wonderful tools to manage pain. And these are just some of the pain um, or the medications families that we can utilize to manage pain. But despite that, there are still a lot of challenges that patients and physicians face, and we're not able to address uh, a significant portion of uh, the patient's uh, concerns. So. Being a physician scientist, it allows me to reverse the order of things a little bit. So I'm able to take problems from the clinic and take it to the lab. And the question would be, can I figure something out in the lab to take it back to the clinic? And truth be told, um, the University of Arizona encourages daring questions. So I found a lot of support when I had some ideas. And one of them was, OK, so we know medications are chemicals. So we're using chemical energy to modulate pain. Well, what about if we use a different type of energy? What if we use light therapy? And we already know that light therapy is being used for cer certain medical conditions like seasonal affective disorder. And knowing that there are neural neuronal circuitry that goes from the retina to the pain modulating center in the brain, well, the question will be, if I expose the visual system, or if I utilize or repurpose the visual system and expose it to certain wavelengths of light, will I be able to modulate pain? This was um, a new approach for me. My PhD was in pharmacology and toxicology. And here I am playing with light. Thankfully, I found a lot of support, especially from Dr. Vandra, <laughs> who persuaded me not to quit that research and move forward. And that really encouraged me to ask, what if? What if I expose some animals to green light or different types of light? So the initial experiments we did was exposing rats to all the spectrum uh, of light that I was able to get, including infrared. And what we noticed, especially with uh, green and blue, is that these are naive rats. They became less sensitive to noxious stimulus. That means their threshold to respond to a noxious stimulus increased. They were not bothered by uh, noxious stimulus. But these were naive rats. So we asked the same questions in post-surgical pain rats. So we pre-exposed rats prior to surgery to green light. And we found out that pre-exposure to green light was just as powerful as opioids in decreasing this po their post-operative anti-nociceptive I mean, nociceptive response. Same thing in chronic pain. We utilized HIV model for chronic pain. Mm -hmm. And we noticed that with green light exposure, not only it reversed the pain or the nociception associated with uh, HIV, but it made them also uh, I don't want to say analgesic, because Frank will throw something at me if I say that. But it made them go above their normal uh, baseline. And this work was independently confirmed by different groups all, all over the world. And now we ask ourselves this really simple question. This is a relatively safe and affordable method to manage pain. We did not see any side effects, because we're using low energy light. So if or can we translate the work that we saw in rats and take it to humans? So we ran two clinical trials. 
One was for fibromyalgia and the other for migraine. And what we noticed in both groups is that pain was significantly reduced. And um, I have to preface this by saying these are patients that failed every available therapy. So they, we tried everything for fibromyalgia. We tried everything for migraine. These were the non-responders. So with green light, um, both groups, the fibromyalgia and the migraine, reported at least 50% reduction in pain. But, and, and we published these clinical trials. But in addition to the reduction in pain, we were also surprised because patients reported other things. They reported improved quality of life, decreased anxiety, and improved sleep. In fact, the reported sleep got better before pain improved. So we sat down in the lab, uh, especially with Dr. Martin, and we asked, what is in common between all these modalities? And neuroinflammation was one of them. So we looked at the microglia. On the left is a microglia that was exposed, and, and these were from uh, chronic pain uh, animals uh, at the brain. And on the left, um, you can see this is a microglia exposed to white light. It's a 3D reconstruction. And uh, when exposed to white light as a control treatment, uh, we saw that the microglia remain activated or there was significant uh, gliosis. And we can tell that because the cell body is bigger and the processes are shorter. However, when they are exposed to green light, and that the slide or the video playing on the right side, we notice that the cell body is getting smaller and the processes are getting bigger. So this is more of a survey mode. So we noticed a significant reduction in uh, activation. And we confirmed this by biochemical analysis. We saw a significant reduction in tumor necrosis factor alpha and IL-6. And that brought us to the next part. Now we have all these wonderful data, we want to take it to the next level. And that's where collaboration, especially with Oklahoma State University, became crucial because not only it allowed us to increase our workforce, but also to change our thought process and um, approach things that we have not approached. We were complementary to one another. So the collaboration between the University of Arizona and Oklahoma State University by these three handsome men resulted in, in a, a lot of benefits and more to come. So right now, um, in addition to pain, we're looking at neurodegenerative conditions. So we uh, were able to obtain a genetically engineered strain of rats that exhibit Alzheimer's symptoms early on. And what we noticed when they are exposed to green light, their cognitive uh, ability improved by about 50%. Similarly, uh, in PTSD, we were able to show that green light blocked the establishment in PTSD and rats, but also even rats that had PTSD, we were able to reverse the symptoms. And this was very crucial finding because the Department of Defense and the Veteran, the veteran Administration are really interested in these uh, two modalities for both their active um, military personnel and also their veterans. So where are we today? It's really a tale to be told. So we started with departmental support and encouragement, which uh, provided us with a startup funding. And that gave us the preliminary data to get uh, NIH funds. And then we got a university support, which allowed us to do two clinical trials. And now that secured a Department of Defense and a VA funds. And now we moved forward with our strategic alliance with Oklahoma State University. And now we're planning several phase three uh, clinical trials with the idea that we actually want to change the standard of care. So, so far we have, what, we ha what have we accomplished so far? So we established a flow mechanism between clinical practice and basic science. We integrated different departments at the University of Arizona under the Comprehensive Pain and Addiction Center umbrella. We introduced not just a new therapy, but a new platform, which is the green light therapy. 
We created a prototype for delivering the green light therapy. Co we co-founded and exclusively licensed the green light therapy through our startup, Luxon Therapeutics, to commercialize the technology for the benefit of the broader public. We're applying for FDA approval right now for, uh, for the green light therapy. And we established the, uh, a strategic alliance between the University of Oklahoma and uh, University of, uh, I'm sorry, uh, Arizona, <laughs> Oklahoma State University and the University of Arizona to advance medical care. And we secured a Department of Defense funding for post-surgical pain and a VA funding for traumatic brain injury research. And what we are looking for right now is to in, uh, investigating the effect of green light therapy on Alzheimer's disease, uh, managing PTSD and traumatic brain injury using green light therapy, studying the immune response in the CNS after green light exposure, understanding the mechanism uh, of action for green light therapy, discovering new indications with focus on sleep, strengthening the alliance with Oklahoma State University, and increasing phase three clinical trials, establishing a, a strategic alliance between the University of uh, Arizona and Oklahoma State University to advance medical care, optimizing a green light therapy prototype for wide medical use. And finally, I would like to uh, mention that this work would not have been possible without the help of so many people, and most importantly, the support from the University of uh, Arizona, Department of Anesth uh, Anesthesiology and Pharmacology, the University of Arizona Comprehensive Pain and Addiction Center, Oklahoma State University Center for Health Sciences, the National Institute of Health, and National uh, Center for Complementary and Integrative Health, the Department of Defense, and finally, the, vet, the Veteran Administration. And with that, I would like to thank you. These are the wonderful people that helped bringing this research to, to life. Okay, thank you, Mohab. That was fantastic. And, uh, you know, it's just great to be able to see therapies that are non-pharmacological also being advanced into our clinical trials. It is my pleasure to, to share with you a little bit of wrap-up of what you've already heard this morning and, more importantly, uh, where we're going. And so uh, let's just jump right into this and, uh, and talk a little bit about how uh, we are going to be hopefully rapidly pushing towards a new long-lasting high-affinity molecule uh, and or an antibody to help prevent fentanyl overdoses. And I just want to stress the point, Dr. Kyle did a great job of this, but how difficult this is. We all know fentanyl is extremely potent with high affinity for the mu receptor, and so why we don't really have new medications to help with overdose. And we are pushing that way. So we have that compound. We have something that uh, has high affinity that can last much longer and we hope to push that forward. And so our goal here is to have a submission of an IND soon. Of course, I'd love to be able to put a, a couple years here. I'm always kind of warned uh, by, uh, of course, Dr. Kyle himself, knowing how long it takes to get compounds through uh, an IND and, in, and approved by the FDA. But we're hoping that we can do this quickly. And of course, the big ask or goal or need here is support for these studies, pharmacokinetic studies, toxicological studies, manufacturing to be able to do this. But I think we can make a difference in the fentanyl overdose if we can take compounds like this and get them available. Along those lines, we also uh, are developing a novel medication-assisted treatment that may help reduce chronic pain and aid in sleep. Uh, you saw a little bit of that work, again, that Dr. Kyle pointed out that's being uh, progressed uh, by different means. And obviously, we have uh, an NIH uh, NIDA PPG grant that's being reviewed here real soon. And we hope that funding for that will be able to push that through. But our goal is to, of course, have two or three of those new lead compounds. And I can say they are just really uh, unique molecular structures that we have. Uh, that other groups don't, as far as we know, that we can actually push that through the preclinical work and get that also closer towards an IND to help those with opiate use disorder. We also want to concentrate on sex differences. So you saw very clearly that there are differences and that uh, no academic institution has really paid attention to this. And so our goal is to really emphasize female pain syndromes, as presented by Dr. Pareka. And we want to be able to uh, take and confirm these novel targets, things like prolactin, 
uh, and other novel targets uh, and move those forward towards clinical research, uh, along with the idea of, of developing a proof of concept in humans that the, uh, these targets may be valid to push forward for clinical trials. And again, so we want continual preclinical support from the centers and federal agencies so that we can move rapidly towards clinical trials. Other thing uh, that we heard is repurposing of FDA approved meds. This is one of the quickest ways that we can actually get help out to people with chronic pain in opiate use disorder. Uh, that's ongoing, uh, not only with some of the compounds that we're testing in metastatic cancer trials, but obviously there's some work uh, going on with companies like Atsuka. Uh, again, with, through our partnership to be able to take something that is an antidepressant, this uh, brexapiprosol, uh, into medication-assisted treatments. And so we're trying our best to be able to try to repurpose compounds that are out there already approved to get them in to help patients with opiate use disorder. Two more points, and I'll hand it over to our next speaker. But our next one is to offer novel therapies, non-pharmacological, as you've seen with Dr. Ibrahim's presentation, as well as looking into other things uh, besides light therapy. But we really want to advance that light therapy into the recovery room. So you can imagine that every recovery room after surgery may have green light to help with reduction of inflammation and pain, uh, eye protective uh, covering to reduce things like pain or anxiety and to improve sleep. And so obviously there, Dr. Ibrahim is working hard with partners and in industry and to ex expand the collaboration that uh, he already has with the VA and the D Department of Defense. And uh, as all we pointed out this morning, the fact that it's not just the areas of preclinical and clinical research, but we also want to increase the workforce and the education to prevent opiate overdoses and uh, substance use disorders. So we really want to emphasize this to get out into the communities our paraprofessionals, our workforce, the education is really critical to both physicians, to our community members, our students, so that we can really try to uh, inform and educate people on opiate use disorder. And so we hope that our paraprofessional will have over 250 individuals in another four years. As you see, we're continuing to just put that out into our communities so that we can help treat and uh, prevent overdoses. And of course, uh, the need here is to continue to get that funding from organizations like HRSA, the Human, uh, the human Research and Service uh, component of the National Institutes or the uh, federal government, so that we can continue to push that forward. And so these are some of the things that we're rapidly working on to move things forward to, uh, to make a difference. And so uh, with that, uh, what I'd like to do is uh, really introduce our guest speaker, I'll say. Uh, it's really an honor to have uh, Dr. Valentino here. She is the Director of the Divisions of Neuroscience and Behavior of the National Institutes on Drug Abuse. Dr. Valentino uh, is a leading expert in our field and the recipient of the NIH, NIH's Director's Award for Scientific Leadership and Vision. She's a Fellow of the American Society of Pharmacology and Experimental Therapeutics. She's also a Fellow and current Secretary of the American College of Neuropsychopharmacology and a member of the scientific board of the Brain Behavior Research Foundation. And finally, she's also the founding and current editor in the chief of the journal Neurobiology of Stress. And so please join me in extending a warm welcome to Dr. Valentino. I wanted to go to a blue background. There. Okay. Oh, okay, great. Uh, well, thank you so much, Todd. I don't have any slides. I'm just going to chat with you for a little bit. And first, just want to tell you that I am delighted and honored to be a part of this panel that highlights uh, one of our center grant programs, the Center for Excellence in Addiction Studies that's led by Dr. Pereka and highlights this really visionary uh, collaboration whose mission uh, resonates with the mission of the National Institute on Drug Abuse um, to really uh, advance the science in pain and addiction and uh, use that new knowledge to be able to improve the public health and, um, and individual health. Uh, as you've heard today, the crisis of substance use disorder uh, it continues, continues to escalate. It's a tragedy not just of overdoses, but 
uh, of a decrement in the quality of life, of loss of employment, uh, a breakdown in, in family structure, and also an economic burden. And uh, basic science that my division of uh, neuroscience and behavior supports has to address the many challenges that substance use disorder poses. So the most immediate and pressing challenge is that of the uh, rising overdose uh, deaths, the, the great escalation in that that was pointed out by, by Dr. Kyle. And um, this really became a, a prominent issue when fentanyl uh, sort of came came out onto the the streets, and because fentanyl and uh, the synthetic opioids are so much more potent than morphine and he or heroin, about a hundred to a thousand times more potent, and so um, as Dr. Kyle pointed out, it, it's uh, we have an antidote, we have naloxone, but it's much more difficult to reverse an overdose due to these agents because of their high potency. So you have to increase the dose of naloxone, you have to give it more frequently. Additionally, the characteristics of the fentanyl overdose are somewhat different. So it's not just respiratory depression, but you see what's called this wooden chest syndrome or this chest wall rigidity. And we don't know the physiologic basis of that yet. We think it's different than respiratory depression, and it's more difficult to uh, reverse with naloxone. So clearly, we need new agents. And, um, and so one of the things that NIDA has done is to partner with the National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Diseases on this uh, uh, program called uh, the Counteract Program or a Chemical Countermeasures Research Program. And uh, the goal of that program is to develop countermeasures against chemical threats and fentanyl and its related synthetic analogs are, are on that list. And so through this, we've been supporting research that's uh, uh, some basic research in trying to understand the mechanisms of things like chest wall rigidity and other toxicities that are produced by fentanyl, uh, development of uh, new uh, antagonists, long-acting antagonists, as is the goal of, of the collaboration presented here, um, to, to modify existing antagonists so that they're better and longer acting, to develop agents that sequester fentanyl and pull it out of the system, to develop uh, drugs that just counteract or have opposite effects um, to fentanyl and its analogs, and also immune therapies, and I believe that was mentioned here as well, monoclonal antibodies and vaccines. Uh, another major challenge that basic research has to answer is that this is a, a, this is a dynamic situation. It's a, it's a shifting landscape. So what started out with um, uh, being over-prescribing -pres of prescription opioids shifted to overdoses with heroin and then seeing fentanyl. And when fent fentanyl came on, uh, uh, on the scene, that because it was so potent, you saw this great escalation in overdose deaths. Then this collided with the COVID epidemic. And the COVID epidemic brought on layers of stress, economic stress, social stress, even biological stress, and inability of individuals who had substance use disorder to go out and get treatment. So that's when you saw that graph actually go up after 2019 and escalate again. So you have this ever-changing landscape, and with that, the demographics actually uh, of the crisis also changed. So what started off as being predominantly male, Caucasian, as COVID came onto the scene, we saw more minorities being affected, Native American tribes, um, uh, African Americans, and more women being affected. So, um, I, you know, you'd be surprised perhaps to know that uh, substance use disorder is one of the major causes of mor maternal mortality, and that's another public health crisis in this country. So I'm, I'm really encouraged that this collaboration is focused on the health of women and is also well positioned to, uh, to improve the health of Native American tribes that are so um, affected by this crisis. Um, so another, another challenge is, uh, and this was mentioned also by others, is that we're not dealing with one drug. 
Uh, this is morphed into poly substance use. So you see fentanyl mixed in with cocaine and, and other stimulants. So we're dealing with this kind of pharmacologic mosaic that has these emergent properties that we really don't know how to treat yet. And um, most recently, we've been seeing a combination of xylazine with fentanyl. Xylazine is a, um, a sedative. It's uh, used in, in veterinary medicine as an anesthetic. And we don't, we're seeing this actually more on the East Coast than on the West Coast. And we don't really know how that is changing the toxicity of fentanyl. So we're supporting research in that area. But it, this brings to light that we always have to be aware or, or thinking about what's the next drug, what's going to be emerging. And uh, with xylazine now, because it's a sedative, we've been thinking that we have to keep our eye out on more, um, more sedatives being mixed in with, with fentanyl. Xylazine also has its own uh, toxicity. It produces these very severe skin lesions which can become um, infected, and we, we don't know the basis of that yet. So basic uh, research also has to uh, recognize that, that substance use disorder has sort of many phases, and I, I think Dr. Uh, Pereka brought this up, that, that it's not sort of just one thing, but there, it, it's a cycle with many different stages, and each stage is uh, characterized by different cognitive processes which are underlined by different, um, different circuits, different neural substrates. So for example, um, uh, you know, you start off with initial drug use and the drug is very salient and it's very rewarding and then with continued use, you develop impulsive behavior and negative affect begins to come in. And then there are periods of abstinence and withdrawal and that withdrawal has to be treated. And, uh, and then this is followed by periods of relapse prior to recovery. So each of these stages may require a different treatment. We may actually need a toolbox um, to treat individuals with substance use disorder depending on the stage that they're in. Um, another challenge, again brought up today, is the high degree of comorbidity. You're not dealing with just substance use disorder. It's highly comorbid with other disorders. We heard about uh, two today, pain and, and sleep. Uh, but it's also highly comorbid with a number of stress-related psychiatric disorders, anxiety, depression, and post-traumatic stress disorder. And this comorbidity really um, highlights that there are sort of common uh, pathologic mechanisms or, or uh, that these uh, disorders are converging on common targets in the brain. And, and if basic research can identify those common targets and deliver treatments to those common targets, then we can impact a constellation of symptoms. We can, uh, we can alleviate pain, we, we can improve uh, sleep, and we could treat substance use disorders. So, um, so, so finding the basis or, or what those convergent targets are is gonna be um, very important. We've kind of, uh, become interested in uh, the use of neuromodulation to be able to change activity in brain networks that might underlie uh, these common comorbidities. And, uh, and we've become very interested in sleep. This has been uh, really an understudied um, uh, concept, uh, understudied um, comorbidity. Uh, we've known for a long time that illicit drugs interfere with sleep that sleep disruption can drive drug use, it can uh, promote relapse, and it can interfere with recovery. And we know that there are some uh, particular circuits that are common between sleep and arousal and substance use disorder. So um, I was actually really excited to hear about Dr. Ibram's work with, uh, with uh, phototherapy. One of the, uh, uh, some of the research that we're funding is focused on these um, photosensitive retinal ganglion cells that, um, that uh, regulate circadian rhythm and they're loaded with opioid receptors. So opioids can affect their activity and they project to uh, regions of the brain that are involved in reward. And so, um, uh, so uh, that there may be a use for phototherapy, not just in pain, but also in substance use disorder.
Oh, finally, there's a great deal of individual uh, variability because there are multiple determinants of um, uh, who may become vulnerable to a substance use disorder, genetic determinants, sex determinants, uh, development, when during development one is exposed to a drug uh, is an important determinant. Um, and, and so we're, we're trying to, uh, we're funding studies that are looking at the genetic basis of substance use disorder. Uh, we're very interested in sex differences research as uh, some, what was presented here. Um, and we're also funding research that's showing that uh, the density and the signaling of opioid receptors is different in females and males. We know that there are different windows of vulnerability when individuals are uh, exposed to, to a drug, um, when circuits are just forming and, and exposure to drugs can interfere with the programming of those circuits and then can impact behavior in the long term. So I mentioned all these several challenges, but I'm very excited about new research coming up, such as uh, what was presented today. I'm ever optimistic uh, about meeting these challenges. The um, uh, NIDA is, is supporting a landmark longitudinal study you may have heard about, the ABCD study, Adolescent Brain Development Cognitive Study. It's the largest long-term study of brain development and child health uh, conducted in the US. It's following kids from age 10 to age 20, getting measures of neuroimaging, cognitive measures, biosamples, uh, activity measures, and, and uh, indices of, of uh, socio-environmental socio measures. And all of these data are going to go into a database that it's going to be open access. Anybody can uh, mine these data. And, and the hope is that that's going to generate a lot of secondary analysis that in the end will tell us factors that can predict the developmental trajectory of substance use. And then we have a complementary study that we just started to that called the HBCD, Healthy Brain Cognitive Development, that's going to take, um, do the same thing, but from birth to age eight. So these are very promising, impactful endeavors. We're supporting innovative chemistry that's elucidating the structural dynamics of proteins that drugs interact with at the atomic level, and not just their structure, but how they change their structure when molecules bind. And, um, and with that knowledge and uh, being able to screen these ultra-large uh, chemical libraries, this is really going to advance drug discovery. And finally, um, I want to mention there are cutting edge technologies that are emerging from the NIH supported brain initiative that really are uh, fueling discoveries that are telling us how the brain functions. And uh, one of the things they're doing is developing a brain atlas in three species, rodent, non-human, primate, and human, that's going to tell us the makeup of every cell in the brain, its, uh, its shape, its morphology, what it's connected to, and its physiologic properties. And, um, and it's, a, it's an incredible, ambitious endeavor, and it was just uh, actually in New York Times reported because uh, Science Magazine just came out with a special issue highlighting, uh, you know, there were 21 publications that highlighted research from this work. So, um, so at NIDA, what I've been trying to do is encourage researchers to use those cutting edge techniques to answer questions that are related to pain and addiction so that we can understand how uh, the brain is affected by drugs, how it changes with chronic drug use from molecule to, uh, to cell to circuit to behavior. So, uh, so again, I, I'm really encouraged and optimistic for the future that we can meet these challenges. Thank you very much for this opportunity. Thank you so much, Dr. Valentino. That was just fantastic. We're going to have the whole panel come up here, but uh, but again, uh, just as a, a as a word of of of, of thanks to Dr. Valentino. She had two other talks given this week, and she goes, can I just come and tell you all about NIDA but not have to present slides? I said, absolutely. That was fantastic. So I really uh, appreciate that. So again, we're going to have all the speakers come on up and uh, take a seat. Uh, if you got one with the microphone, then you got to work that microphone and pass it back and forth. Um, and it's really the time for, uh, for us to all sort of answer questions. I know we're on a limited time here, but uh, 
I'll go ahead and start with the first question. And uh, the first question is going to go to Dr. Pereka in the fact that uh, I think you did a beautiful job sort of laying out the difference of what physiological pain is versus pathological pain. And, you know, the big question always in my mind for many years is, can, can we develop something that might be able to inhibit that pathological pain, but then preserve the physiological? Because it seems like it's one of those very difficult tasks to do, and I'm always curious of your thoughts on something like that. Well, that is, that is the challenge. I think that's the thing that um, has always been, um, you know, a, a major unknown question right now. You know, uh, most of us that study pain um, like to study cells and like to study, you know, connections between cells. Uh, so that's uh, really studying sensory neurobiology. We're good at that. We're not really good at what the brain does with that information. And what I mentioned is that uh, what opioids, uh, you know, magically do is they, they kind of disconnect the mind from the body. Mm -hmm. And um, that's kind of our goal a little bit as well. You know, we have other drugs that are used, like gabapentin. Gabapentin's used. It works sort of sometimes in some people. It's not a drug of abuse. Rita, I don't know if um, you uh, have been following this, but, you know, gabapentin is not a drug of abuse, really, on the street. But I was reading recently that it is being abused in prison populations. And so one of the things that we've learned is that the way that uh, some drugs are, um, uh, actually work is not actually the way that uh, that we've um, published. You know, many of the publications think about the effects of, uh, of drugs like gabapentin on sensory neurons. But actually, what they do is they also work in the mind. Mm -hmm. They change, you know, where uh, where you are. They disconnect the mind from the body. And, you know, I guess in, in pr prison populations, you don't want to be there. And that's what this drug actually helps you to do. So I think what that tells us is that there are other ways that we can get at the circuits in the cortex that actually dissociate the sensory input and the meaning of the sensory input. And uh, so, you know, it, it is, it, it, I think it will be possible by understanding the circuitry in the cortex that to, um, to separate uh, the, um, you know, the, the ouch from mm -hmm. the nociception. Right. So, and I think, I think it's possible. Excellent. Thank you. Dr. Dake. Todd, uh, <clears throat> first I want to congratulate everyone. You guys knocked it out of the park, and, and Todd, thanks for putting together this dream team. I don't know how many of you are really a, can appreciate what a remarkable opportunity it was for all of us to, to get this insight in, in like two and a half hours. I feel like we're up to speed on a lot of things. But I have a I have a question for Rita, because I won't have a chance to follow up with you. But uh, you know, uh, obviously, Narcan, naloxone is—it's not ubiquitous. But clearly, we've we've reached we've gone over a threshold and where it's available, over the counter, it's available many places, etc. But obviously, we're sort of playing catch up. We're in the rearview mirror, and now with. Uh, synthetic opioids and the development of all sorts of fentanyl reversers or, or uh, inhibitors. Is there an opportunity to sort of catch up by using NIDA to influence FDA and others to sort of fast track or give sort of a, a breakthrough designation, if you will, so we can get this before, you know, because as you said, it's a dynamic landscape. Things are moving through. By the time this thing gets through, we'll be on maybe just to something else that we won't yet have a reversal for. So is that in your head about how you can do that? We always want to fast track, <laughs> and, uh, and our influence over the FDA is, a, it, it is always tough. Um, although, although we have ongoing um, uh, conversations with them. You know, one, uh, there, there recently was, uh, I think, approval for nalmefine, which is a new um, uh, opioid antagonist, very similar to naloxone, but I think longer lasting in a, a nasal uh, form of that. So, so we are making progress in those areas. Now, um, if you're familiar with the uh, Helping End Addiction Long Term, that's a, a program that uh, started about, I don't know, about five years ago, and um, trying to develop new uh, treatments for uh, opioid use disorder and for overdose, and, and, um, and our other division, Division of uh, uh, Medical uh, 
you know, thera therapeutics and medical consequences is uh, running that program. And so, um, so they're working on the sort of the drug discovery and drug development side of that and working with FDA to, um, to develop these new drugs. But as you, as you know, the, you know, it's more than antagonists that we need. Um, you know, we're looking at other, the, the uh, uh, monoclonal antibodies, the vaccines, those immune therapies, um, uh, even things like uh, uh, GLP antagonists, the uh, things like Ozempa, you know, you've heard of uh, these compounds that anecdotally um, individuals uh, I say that a lot of individuals say that they they don't not just that they don't want to eat they don't want to take drugs they don't want to drink alcohol so so um, we're even looking at at those kinds of molecules for um, for treatments so maybe you could just give us a little bit about I'm very interested in vaccines what what that looks like and what some of those targets are and who's doing well, it. oh oh well so um so vaccines are against fentanyl yeah and yeah there's and there's uh actually back uh someone's uh, working on a vaccine against xylazine uh so and we've had uh individuals working on vaccines against heroin as well so interesting and i think some combos mm -hmm. Yes, cocaine. That's right. Yeah. Frank, did you want to make a? Uh, yeah. I was just going to make a comment. Uh, you know, uh, based on what Dr. Dake was saying about catching up and about being behind, and one of the things that Dr. Kyle mentioned, which I th uh, is uh, one of the programs that we're just in the process of starting to develop, is we've learned that um, a lot of drug abusers are now delivering their drugs through vaping, and you know this is important because it produces very rapid entry into the brain and the speed of drug entry into the brain matters in terms of the effects that, that we get. And, uh, and so we have uh, started to, um, uh, as part of our uh, uh, collaborative effort, to, to investigate the consequences of vaping in preclinical models, not only as a method for producing, um, uh, you know, for how this is done for, by drug abusers, but for therapeutic drug delivery. And we think that that actually is quite exciting. Uh, Dr. Valentina just mentioned the nasal administration. That's a promising area, but sometimes blood levels that occur from uh, nasal administration are not high enough. And vaping may give us a completely different approach uh, to, um, to, to get sufficient quantities of the medicines that we want into the bloodstream. Uh, maybe uh, Dr. Kyle. Yeah, back, back to your original question. I just wanted to add on to what was already said. I think uh, we all feel the sense of urgency and fast track is always what we're trying to do. Um, but just as a matter of perspective, I think from the FDA's point of view, their, their first concern is just safety. And so in order to demonstrate, and so from their point of view, if, if we invent a new molecule, and by that I mean something with a new chemical structure that has never been in humans before, we can't just say, hey, this looks great in an animal. Let's run a human clinical trial. There's a long number of study, long list of studies that have to be performed that demonstrate safety. And not just any safety, it's reproduction safety, it's liver toxicities and liver enzymes and all, all, all these other things. And it takes, a, it takes a while, you know, to get through that. And, to, and, and, and the safety has to be at least at up to the dose and beyond the dose that you want to use therapeutically. So you have to show that even at high concentrations, you don't want to you don't want to try to fix one problem, but then cause another problem. Yeah. So those are just for perspective. I just wanted to mention that those are some of the reasons why it does take a little bit of time because people's safety here is a main concern. Yeah, I I, I totally agree, and I I hope I understand that. But you know, it's this isn't COVID, but. 77,000, 80,000 people dying a year, uh, you know, mRNA vaccines against COVID, mm -hmm. those were developed and ran through pretty fast. You know, I, I think, again, it's the urgency you mentioned, getting that impact that this is, I, you know, it's just one of the most critical problems in the U.S. Yeah, and I'll just add, I know that, that Dr. Kyle made me aware of this, but also speaking with DEA officers, is the fact that the products of fentanyl that come across the border and even the chemicals to be to be made uh, again dr kyle made it apparent to me that something like this is needed for people who work there our border patrol people 
even the dogs. I mean, again, this would be something that would be preventative, long lasting, something, a dose that would be given to someone like Border Patrol or even to the dogs early in the morning before actually going out on duty to prevent the, uh, the overdose of sniffing in things like fentanyl. So it's something that I think is critically needed rapidly. Okay, other questions? Uh -huh. Microphone back here. Thank you. So, hi. First, thank you, everybody, uh, for the talks. It was really wonderful. And so, I have uh, one first question for Dr. Poreka. So, as everybody knows, there is a lot of clinical trials that are failing nowadays, either for Alzheimer's or other symptoms, other disorders. And in your talk, you presented very well the intricacies between depression and uh, anxiety, chronic pain. And so I'm wondering if, do you think all these failures could be explained because we are trying to develop one drug which targets one symptoms? And could, could, we, could we address these failures by, by developing drugs that have multiple targets? Um, so multifunctional drugs, you mean? Yes. Yes. So that's one. Uh, that's one idea. the The other. The other idea is to find commonalities uh, in the mechanisms that can promote these these various uh, brain disorders. So the first thing I'd, I'd like to say is that you know we we haven't discovered a new medicine for the treatment of pain in decades, uh, a new mechanism of action. Uh, but that's also been true for other brain disorders. And the thing you have to remember is that uh, chronic pain is a neurological disorder. And uh, it is um, related to other uh, adaptations in brain circuits. And one of the things that um, uh, has been interesting to us uh, has been the possibility that there may be an underlying relationship to, um, to things that affect the brain overall. Like, and we mentioned sleep here. And I'm just going to go back to this idea of sleep, because what we know is that in non-REM sleep, uh, there is a system, the lymphatic system, that clears toxic waste from the brain. And if you have sleep disruption, that system is not active. And so you have an accumulation of toxic uh, materials that occur in synapses in the brain. And so that can promote all kinds of neurological disorders, chronic pain, um, opioid use disorder. Uh, it, can, it can potentially be relevant to other uh, neurological disorders. And sleep disruption is common across all of these diseases. It's common in Parkinson's, in Alzheimer's, it's, it's common in chronic pain, it's common in all of these conditions. So, you know, what is actually happening, you know, to the brain that may be a commonality, that maybe uh, we can start to get uh, insight into, you know, how we can approach normalizing the, those uh, changes. So that's one possibility. The, the bifunctional, multifunctional molecules are tough. Um, chemistry, chemistry is tough. Approval is tough. I mean, the, the toxicology is tough. All of those things, uh, you know, make it uh, very, very challenging. Thank you. Uh, can ahead, I? Um, yeah, yeah that, that's a, a great question and, and uh, a, a good answer. Um, the, the other uh, potential approach is uh, if there are circuits that underlie these. Um, these common symptoms, uh, one potential approach is to use neuromodulation. And uh, this is being used more for, you know, the, the, this is kind of newer and um, uh, uh, less explored, but we're looking more in, into supporting research in this area because you might be able to impact on a, a network, really, that underlies uh, depression, pain, sleep, and substance use disorder. So, um, so looking at that, and, and uh, with regard to fast tracking, you know, you can better uh, get through a device <laughs> than you can a drug. So, uh, uh, so these may be uh, more efficient ways, or other ef efficient approaches. One other comment on that, just from a practical point of view, if you think about one molecule that's going to hit multiple drug targets, it may bind to all of the drug targets, but its potency and efficacy may not be the same at the different targets. So it may be like on a scale of one to 10, it may hit target number one like a 10, but may hit target number three like a one. So to get the impact of one, you have to use a higher concentration to bring up the one, right? 
but that brings on side effects from the other target because now you're way over what you needed to have there. So the issue of polypharma, one of the issues with polypharmacology is usually a very difficult side effect profile that really complicates clinical trials and it actually turns into a delay. It it's, can be much more complicated. Just some inside uh, pragmatic perspective on that one. And, and if I may add, another approach or a complementary approach is to capture the pathology upstream before it targets different systems. And uh, one of the reasons I'm very excited about phototherapy in general is because this can be fast-tracked because it's low energy light and uh, no side effects have been reported. We have not seen any side effects or any adverse events in uh, animals or humans. Uh, low energy light, it's not laser, it's LED. So that will, fast, uh, that will most likely fast track it and address several systems all at once. Moab, I'm gonna, we've got about five more minutes, but Moab, I'm gonna uh, tag on another question. So how long does something like light therapy work? I mean, obviously these are patients that have chronic pain for a long period of time, and is this something that could be used for a long period of time or is needed for a long period of time? So that's an excellent question, Todd. Thank you for asking it. So uh, I'll start with animals, then I'll, I'll share the data with you about humans. So in animals, um, uh, in chronic pain models, when we terminate the light exposure, the, res the residual effect lasts for maybe eight to 10 days. It decreases with time, um, but about eight to 10 days, and that's because one of the mechan we're still trying to understand the mechanism, but one of the things that we saw with green light exposure, and that's through the visual system, is that it molecularly changes the, uh, some of the pain pathways. So it changes the expression of the NMDA receptors, for example. Uh, in humans, we, we did do clinical trials. The exposure uh, paradigm was two hours, one to two hours every night for 10 weeks. And what we saw is that some patients, uh, they saw that as impractical. So after the 10 weeks uh, study duration, they start playing with it. And I'm, I'm going to use the, wo the word playing. <laughs> and some patients reported to me anecdotally that they only needed it maybe once a week to twice a week. After they established, mm -hmm. um, I'm going to use a pharmacological concept here, a loading dose maybe. Mm -hmm. uh, so they, they get the full effect of the light uh, exposure. And then after that, they only had to use it maybe for once or twice a week for 30 minutes. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Thank you. I have a couple quick sure. questions. I know we don't have much time left, but for Moab, about the phototherapy. In the blue-green spectrum, are the receptors have a higher concentration of opioid receptors? Or opioid in the, in the retina, are they there? Are there, why are they those, what's the reason for blue-green, I guess I should just say. That's a better way to phrase it. it it's, it's a very good question. Uh, there's still a lot of things we need to understand about it, but um, there are different types of photoreceptor that respond to different wavelengths. Yeah. And um, the, the green-blue spectrum, the, the photoreceptors that respond to it or uh, are responsive to it, um, they do not have a different composition in terms of the opioid uh, concentration or mm -hmm. opioid density. Um, however, that being said, it's not just the image forming cells that mediate the effect of uh, phototherapy. Because we had a case study actually with a colorblind person, so we know that we knew that his uh, photoreceptor cells, the image forming cells, were not functional. Um, so we hypothesized, the hypothesis was that at least part of the phototherapy or photolight therapy is mediated by the intrinsic photosensitive ganglionic cell. And his response, uh, obviously that's a, a case report, it's an N of one, but we're going to expand on that. He had history of chronic uh, headaches where a normal, a person with a normal vision, they saw a reduction in both intensity and the frequency of the migraines or the headaches. In this particular individual with uh, color blind, uh, we only saw a change in the intensity 
but not the frequency of, uh, of migraine. Mm -hmm. So it seems that different photosensitive cells mediate different aspects for controlling pain. And my final question, real quick, is in patients without chronic pain, or say drug addiction, do they get a, a, any sort of euphoria or any sort of positive reinforcement from, from phototherapy? So uh, we're actually, we currently have a clinical trial to ad address that question, and we have three groups, one green and two control groups. and. What we've noticed, at least in terms of uh, pain, is that the pain threshold increased um, uh, for uh, for healthy volunteers. So it's it takes a lot of stimulus to to uh, elicit a pain response uh, from them. In terms of euphoria, maybe Lor uh, Laurent can have, have the reported on euphoria. <laughs> On euphoria, I do not know. It has never been tested. But uh, regarding uh, depression and anxiety, it has actually a lot of positive effects. Uh, there was a recent study uh, from a Harvard team. They just used the, a green light, a green diode, uh, during uh, therapy sessions for general anxiety disorders. And just under this light, they improved a lot the results of the therapy. But what I can also add is the opposite of green, which is red. We actually were able to produce uh, a pain model using red in, in animals. And uh, without my knowledge, I have to preface by saying that, some graduate students tried exposure to red light uh, for maybe 10, 15 minutes, and they actually reported dysphoria. So, but we did not try the opposite. Okay, well, we are out of time, so I just want uh, to have you all join me in giving a big round of applause for all of our speakers today. And I also uh, just want to thank you all for allowing me to moderate. I want to thank the team, Dr. Dake, for inviting us here. The teams, I want to thank Rachel, Randy, Melissa, Brian. Uh, Alex is not in here, but I want to thank everybody for helping us put this all together. And thank you. And I want to F last as as Dr. Date come on up here and close out the session. Thank you, Todd, and thanks to everyone for joining us today. We've recorded all of this, so uh, we'll have that available if you want to review anything, and we'll certainly use it uh, bountifully in uh, in our future. But again, just to reiterate, thanks to all the speakers. Rita for coming over, that was a great talk, we appreciate it. And everyone, again, reception tonight will be about five o'clock. If the weather stays like this, upstairs, 13th floor will be beautiful. So thanks again for all participation. <laughs>